I am a large fan of Keyforge. Since its release last year, I have been fascinated by the deck structures, the cards, the strategy, and the overall gameplay. I have been covering it on this channel for a while now, and I've really, really, really been invested in it lately. I've been watching competitive gameplay, I've been watching streams, I've been watching coverage of the set, and that made me really kind of think, how good am I at this game? I haven't really expanded past my local group of friends, I haven't expanded to any local tournaments, and I really wanted to kind of push myself and give myself a goal. I want to compete in the keyboard. Launch into the Crucible with the Vault Warrior Tournament Series, the ultimate Keyforge competition. Starting early 2020, stores around the world will host Vault Warrior tryouts, leading into the Vault Warrior qualifiers. Ten Vault Warrior qualifiers will be held in ten cities, each with a $10,000 prize pool. Top players from each qualifier will advance to the Keyforge Vault Warrior Championship, held in Miami, Florida, with a total prize pool of $100,000. Do you have what it takes to become a Vault Warrior? Find your best deck and enter the Crucible. I don't know how possible that's going to be, I don't know how good I am at this game, and I certainly don't know if I'm going to have the opportunity to compete in the events I need to, but I'm going to try. This is going to be kind of like a mini vlogging series when I can to kind of update my progress in that goal. As of right now, the Fall Tour has just been announced, and they're looking for places to compete and vendors to kind of host the events. So I don't even know if I'm going to be able to play in Colorado at this time, but I'm going to practice, I'm going to study up, and I'm going to do everything I can to compete in this event. So my first steps are to play people. I haven't had a chance to actually play in a local event until last week, where I found a venue where a small but very, very great group of people have been playing Keyforge. Uh, every weekend, and I'm kind of slowly trying to integrate myself into groups like that. One of the biggest kind of concerns I had before then was how 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 is it going to be to play these events? I'm very kind of cautious when it comes into any sort of competitive play, and I do have my own kind of I don't want to say doubts, but more or less kind of social anxiety when it comes to playing and competing because. I want to make sure I'm playing the game right. I want to make sure that I am respectful and I'm doing things properly. I don't want to just jump in and kind of isolate myself and be that person that makes the environment rough. And I know I'm not. I'm not that kind of person. I know the people that don't like to be around in events. And I also don't want to join an event uh, or go to a place to play that I, I, I feel uncomfortable with. And it was very, very kind of hard to kind of get out of my shell. And unfortunately, this event is 45 minutes from my house. That's the closest I can do uh, without going into downtown Denver and playing in one of these really large uh, events. So I, I scoped a place out, and I went last weekend, and I went and I played. I actually went with Trevor, who does some stuff at Schwaldo um, here on the channel. He actually did one of the keyboard tutorials with me. And so he kind of just scouted it out, and I went and played the event. And it worked out. I actually had a great time. I didn't do well. Uh, there are only four of us playing, and I win one and two. But you got to keep in mind that some of these people are playing this game at a very, very high level. One of the uh, gentlemen I talked to actually went to Gen Con and participated in two of the Keyforge Vault Tours, which I haven't had an opportunity to go to since the last Vault Tour coincided with the Imagine Gathering events that I registered for, and it had I had to make a choose. So. It was very interesting to play and see how uh, other people uh, approach the game. The group was great. Uh, I, am, I am a huge uh, proponent of playing in this venue, uh, and the people
people. Uh, I'm trying to bring more people in so the events are larger. I don't think I'm going to be winning any prizes from this event anytime soon. I don't think I'm going to be winning any of the special playmats or key, uh, like the deck boxes and stuff like that. But at this point, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be at their level. I want to be able to consistently play and do well with these gentlemen. So I'm going to break down what decks I was considering and what decks I'm going to be playing with, as well as what I'm going to be playing next week to kind of show my process in what I'm thinking about as far as decks and competitive play. So there were three major decks I wanted to play during this event, and it was a very, very hard choice to kind of pick between them. There were a lot of decks that I wanted to play, but I decided not to because I felt that the decks would be too cheap or the gimmicks on them would might... They're one of those like control and very aggressive decks, decks that I felt that if I went in with these right away, I didn't want to kind of like make the people mad or kind of play poorly. So it was it was a weird situation I was in where I could have played decks that I thought were really good or I could play decks that I would kind of do really poorly at. So you can see that there are three sleeve decks uh, right here and these were the decks I wanted to go with. The first one is Hell Scream the Jester Sensei. Uh, let's actually get the Arcana up there so it actually looks nice. So. Hellscream the Jester Sensei is, I believe, a deck that I've featured on this before. It is Shadow, Mars, and Dis. And the reason why I like this one so much is it is a very solid kind of aggressive deck. You have Mars, you have Shadow to kind of keep the board uh, in control, a lot of Amber gain and disadvantage, and you have the ability to use Dis to do some very, very devastating moves. I'm actually going to look at the deck list here to see what really kind of shines. Obulate is one of the cards I really, really like. Uh, oh yeah, this is the deck with two Succubi. Um, Succubi, if you do not play much of the game, is a card that I personally find very annoying. As you can see right there, if the camera will focus on it. During their draw step, your opponent refills their hand one less card. This deck has two Succubi, so I can sit these out on the board and potentially keep the uh, opponent from playing cards until they remove it. So yeah, you got two of those right there. Uh, I thought that was a very, very uh, interesting uh, card to run, and I felt that it was, um, it was it would be a little too cheap, and I was also basing it on just these two cards to play. I also have a Mind Wiper in here as well, which they told me uh, as I was playing that this card worked way differently than I thought. If I choose an en uh, enemy creature, it captures one enemy of its own side. So what I can do is I can have my opponent's creature or uh, creatures steal an amber from their deck or from their pool and put it on themselves. When I kill them, that actually goes to me. So I didn't. I thought I had to go back to the owner, but it's whenever a creature with a captured amber. Uh, dies, it goes to the opponent. So, very, very interesting on that one. I believe that's how it works. I'm going to have to double check with them. Um, then I have things like uh, Moon Cruiser, just a very, very fun little uh, card that has poison, skirmish, and steal one. Very, very solid and common. Uh, the rares in this deck are kind of few. Uh, Gabos Long Arms and Shatterstorm, which are, eh, they're not the best, but I do I do think overall this deck can be uh, pretty pretty fun. But that, that was uh, the first one I chose uh, not to play. The second deck was the, right here, that is, I call it the Duelist deck, if it will focus here. Yeah, there we go. You can see the name there, and the links will be down for all the decks I'm talking about, so you can kind of scroll through and look at the name of the decks. This deck has seen some foot uh, or visibility on the channel before. This is the deck that has three Squadron uh, Mars cards, and what makes them super potent is it combos with Dusk Witch. And this is a really, really fun combo because of how consistent you can get it on the Mars side, where Dusk Witch says, 
uh, Omega, which means it has to be the last card you play this turn, Elusive, and your creatures enter play ready. So you may be thinking, well, what makes that so special with the Sky Booster Squadron? Sky Booster Squadron says, Reap, return this card to your hand. If he comes in ready on your turn and you have chosen Mars, you can activate him up to six times. Now, this would be an infinite combo if it wasn't for the fact that they have a rule of six in play where you only can play a card up to six times. That is still a free key generated. I think that is a very, very good uh, combo, very quick, and something that's impressive with this deck. There are other things you can do using Dusk Witch that I haven't found yet. There are really good cards like the Fang House, which has Assault and Hazardous, so it is a very potent card to get out on the field and attack. And you have things like Marmo Swarm, gets plus one for each Amber in your pool. So if you build up Amber, you can have a very, very good, powerful combo. The Logos in this deck, I'm still figuring out how well it does. I do have uh, Osmo the Martianologist, which works well with my Mars creatures. And a lot of, play, a lot of people do favor Mars, I've learned. I've kind of had a bias against it since a lot of my decks that I open up are Mars, and I've won things like more Brobnar and Logos and stuff. But my playstyle really goes well with Mars, funny enough. So this was the deck that I was really kind of debating between uh, going with. But the one I did go with is a special, special deck. Now, one of the things that was in infamy when uh, Keyforge first came out was a group of cards known as the Four Horsemen. The Four Horsemen are a Sanctum-specific group of four cards that generate themselves into a deck if one of them is uh, selected for a deck. And these cards are Famine, Death, Plague, or Pestilence in this case, and War. So, what makes them so special is because they synergize with each other so well. They are all very, very powerful. They each have five attack to them, or five power in this case, and they have some pretty potent abilities. War says when he comes into play, and for the remainder of your turn, creatures can be used from all factions to attack, but they only can fight. So he can activate your entire board to be very combat heavy and uh, control the board. Uh, Pestilence, whenever he fights, plays, or is reaped, he deals one damage to each non-horseman creature. That is just an overall good uh, area of effect and damaging ability. Combos better with things like Brobnar, where damage spells are more potent. And then you have Death, which returns each of the Horseman cards from your discard pile into your hand, which goes great with uh, Horseman of War, where you can just kind of go against the board and fight. And my favorite one is Famine. Destroy the least powerful creature whenever it attacks, reaps, or is played. This card is probably my favorite of the four. This card got the most use during the weekend, but this is the one that really kind of like put it on the board because I had to play very strategically with it. And it could just, every turn that I played Sanctum, and he was on the field, he was a threat. And so he was always targeted, but things like death brought him back into play, and I got to use him for some very, very fun things. Another card that I really, really like in this deck, and you're gonna see why I'm really kind of emphasizing it, is a card called Control the Weak. Now what this card says, if my camera didn't shine light into it, choose a house on your opponent's identity card. Your opponent must choose the house as their active house for the remainder of the turn. I bring this up because if you do this strategically against an opponent, you can actually have them skip their turn. And I was able to do that three times over the weekend where my opponent would play their hand and draw back up, but they didn't have anything in the house, so I was able to target that house and stop them from doing their combo and timing it with other discards to uh, really kind of halt their progress. Some of the other cards I really liked in combination with the Four Horsemen were things like Harder They Come, where Purge Dark Creature with the Power of Five or More, and Take Hostages. Oh wait, no, that's not the right one. Doop, 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 doop. All the Sanctum Art looks the same. Shield of Justice, that's the one. 
Uh, for the remainder of your turn, each friendly creature cannot be dealt damage and take hostages. Whenever I deal damage, I get to capture one. So with these two, as well as the four horsemen, especially horsemen of war, I was able to combo in a large amount of damage on my side or on the opponent's side of the field without losing anything on mine. Great, great combo. And uh, even one of the opponents I played said that they haven't seen those cards used in that way before. And I think that goes to show that uh, this game has so much depth to it that people aren't seeing combos until they're kind of introduced in front of them in, in play. I'm trying to think. Another really, really great card in this deck is Martian Hounds. Martian Hounds says that for, uh, for each creature, uh, give a creature I control two plus uh, one power counters. Now top of that with uh, one of the horsemen, like I showed earlier, that deal damage, that gives you a lot of stuff. I had a 20 power horseman of war on the field, and it was just devastating. There was no way that my opponent could get rid of him. So this deck was very solid, uh, and, it, and it had a good time playing it. There were some cards I don't even think I even saw, uh, like Psychic Network. <laughs> Steal one en uh, energy for each uh, red friendly Mars creature. I did not see that once. I was like, I have that in my deck? But yes, that is uh, the deck that I played. It is the Dis of Shorten. So I'll pull up the card right there so you can look it up. They're all scanned. I don't think um, it matters if I show the bar uh, QR code, but just to be safe. So with that, what am I going to play next week? Well, let me find it and show you. That. So this is the deck I'm considering playing. It is D. Granthrum, the Refugee Va Varmint. Experiment. I can't pronounce names of my own decks. Uh, I just call him D-Man uh, because that is a lot easier to say. Now, you can see that I've laid out a lot of cards on the board. This isn't the entire deck. These are just the cards that are very interesting that I would like to show. In the disc section, we have four for Control the Weak. As I said earlier, that lets me essentially have a free turn if I time it correctly. That is brutal. Uh, even so, it means that I can kind of control the state of the game, potentially for four turns in a row, depending on how I draw. Uh, I also have Key to Dis, which is one of the rares in the deck. Sacrifice Key to Dis, destroy each creature. Now this is an Omni ability, so I can use it on any turn. Very, very good threatening thing. Uh, then I have Lash of the Broken Dreams, keys cost plus three during your opponent's next turn. Again, that is just a brutal dis uh, kit, as well as creatures and stuff, but that is like the main kind of draw for this. In the Untamed, we've got uh, Nocturnal Maneuvers, Great Exhaust card, two Dew Fairies, which gain me two Amber each time I reap. Do Fairy, Big Wig, and Inca the Spider. Inca says poison and then stun a creature when it played and reap. Instant gratification by playing the creature, and I can use poisonous uh, to get rid of another one. So, a lot of control coming from this card as well. And at the bottom, we have two bad pennies. Uh, she says, when destroyed, put bad penny into your hand. And I have three. Pawn Sacrifices. Play to sacrifice a creature if you do deal three damage to two creatures. Brutal combo. Insanely brutal combo. Uh, I think that I, I this is just an amazing dis uh, kind of combo. The rest of the dis is kind of subpar. A lot of stealing and kind of archiving. And nothing really special as far as like that part of the kit. But goodness gracious, this alone makes it fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to see how this does over the weekend. Now that they kind of encouraged me to play this deck, I think uh, I can either do really well or really horrible. But I'll update you the next time I make one of these videos. So let me know in the comment section what you think. Do you think that this deck can do well? Do you think I should be playing one of the other decks I featured? Let me know what you guys are playing, what kind of stuff that you really enjoy from Keyforge, what you don't. Let me know. Anything helps. This whole series is kind of to encourage other people to go seek out this game and play it. It's also a personal kind of 
record of how I'm progressing as a player in this game to a professional level, if I even can get that far. But I hope I hope this has been interesting. I hope that this is a series I continue with and give constant updates as the year progresses. Uh, they might kind of scatter out as the year goes on. If I can't do much more content, I will be covering the new set when it comes out. That's going to be a fun thing. So please let me know what you think, uh, how I can improve, how I can make things better. It's very hard to talk about a lot of cards when I'm still learning cards, so I'm going to try to improve on that as I go. But thank you very much for watching and taking the time to check out what is hopefully going to be a fun adventure, and I will see you guys in the next update. From the vaults, this has been Camter. See you next time.